All right, back again. Woke up alive again. Can't believe it. Can't believe I made it this far myself. I cannot seriously believe I'm still alive. I just can't believe it. Here I am. What am I going to do with it today? Well, I'm going to make sure that people's voices get heard because I can do that. I'm going to do a whole bunch of stuff today. It's drizzling snow out. It's dark and dreary. I've got about one third of my Blacktail Hunter book to uh, read and make sure I worded my stories correctly and did a little punctuation there. Man, what a time consumer. I started that a while back and I'm so close to get it done. I just, I just need to get it done. <laughs> I need to get it done. I'm racing to get that done and get it out of the way because I have another one I'm working on at the same time that I really need the world to get their hands on in a big way. And uh, yeah, I'm behind in a whole pile of things. I haven't been talking to anybody for a few days straight via my phone because I'm just, I've just been over freaking whelmed. This past handful of days have been very overwhelming. Someone close to me I thought was going to die the other day. All sorts of crazy shit. But anyway, I'm babbling away. It's time to get some important, more important voices in mind heard. There's a lot of people have been in line waiting. There's a lot of truth to be shared. Now, all right, here we go. There's no title on this email. Sent in to us through me. So in the 2019, <clears throat> excuse me, hunting blacktail season in the oh boy here we go another native word that i'm not familiar with and i have to pronounce properly s-u-o-x-i-o-n hunting unit suxon <laughs> who knows who knows i'm not the best word slinger hunting unit i had to get fuel i had to go get fuel and cougar washington and my friends went hunting without me that sounds odd. Let me read that with Santos one more time. I had to go get fuel, and Cougar, Washington, and my friends went hunting without me. While looking for them, they were supposed to be there. I got there, and they were not there. No tire tracks. And I'm five miles in off of a gravel road, and it's drivable road. I did drive my truck there. I've always had an uneasy feeling in there when I'm in there by myself. I always hear things. I don't get these feelings anywhere else. I'm a U.S. Navy veteran, and I hunt more than any of my friends. I'll go by myself, camp by myself. They have my cougars walk through my camp in the middle of the night, and I sleep good. So, this day, looking for my friends, no radio contact, I decide, well, I'll park my truck here and walk down. They just opened this road up from somewhere, logging. It's an old road, but they updated it. Walking down this road, I have alder on my left, and virgin timber on my right. The treasure, 30 feet apart on my right, very steep. The treasure? Okay, there's gonna be some typos in this. We'll get through it. The trees, I think you probably meant the trees are 30 far. I think you probably meant the trees are 30 feet apart on my right. Very steep, but rolling hills going down steep. I sat over a culvert. Hearing something, I couldn't figure out what it was, and it happened to be just water that would pile up and then splurge over obstructions. I figured that out, kept going down the hill. By the way, we call it the Nutter Road. Friends of ours that have killed many huge bucks in the area. Walk past the culvert, another hundred yards. It's thick on my left and clear on my right. I start walking around the corner, and it's a buck but I don't know what it is. It was laying with its head. It was laying with its head up on my right, like 15 feet off the road. Mind you, no tracks of a vehicle, no vehicles behind me for over five or six miles. I see the buck. It runs downhill in less than three seconds. I can't hear it no more. Yes, the ground is mossy and it's roly poly, but I'm like, the buck just stopped. It's here. It's right there. So I step up the gravel road, which is mostly moss, mossy covered. It's an old road. Take seven steps off the road. I see the deer pop over the next hill, a little tiny hill. I should see the deer. And tree whacking starts. It was very rhythmic, like two 
wax every three seconds. And this went on for over a minute. I cannot believe that any human can make a sound that loud, even with a Louisville slugger. I'm standing there in awe. And then I see something black running from my left to my right at about 30 miles an hour. I'm judging 200 yards down the hill. I only got a glimpse, spots of glimpse of it here and there, and here and there and there and here. And there in my head, I said, it's just a crow flying. But the whacking of the tree was mind blowing. We did not hunt that spot this year and we usually do. But this year we were snowed out. I'll still hunt that same spot, but I will not do it by myself. I did tell my story to everybody at camp, which is about 20 people, and they gave me a hard time, but I don't care. You can use my name. My name is Darren Anderson, and yes, I'm still in the woods. Thanks for all you do, Steve, and I do miss a lot of your hunt stories, but I do like these stories also. Okay, Darren, a little awkward of a read, but we got her, man. You got her across clear. And just a side note on the writing of stories, you guys. The past few days, I've been re reading and rewriting a lot of my stories in my own book. And some of the shit that I write down, it's like, what? Did you just write that, you dumbass? A lot of us go to putting our thoughts and sentences down on paper, typing. And it's not that easy for a lot of us, including me at times. Okay? So I get it. And there you go. Another member. Appreciate your time, man. Appreciate you sending that in. First and foremost, I absolutely appreciate everybody's time. Time. You'll never get it back, right? It's something you'll never get it back. You lend somebody money, lend somebody your labor, get paid for it, but time. That even makes sense. <laughs> you just don't get time back. It's gone, man. It's gone. Past handful of nights, I have literally been absolutely frustrated for real between my ears almost to the point of being angry about how how fast these days have been going it's been making me really frustrated lately i don't know why seems i've just been waking up get a couple things done i feel like i'm getting a couple things done and then it's time to go to bed again it's like come on seriously already it's really frustrating losing time Sorry for that little babble. Here we go. Dear Steve, is there a title on this? Sasquatch in Virginia. Dear Steve, thank you for offering a way for people to share information concerning a topic which needs attention. I never thought I had a Sasquatch experience until I stumbled onto your channel. I have had some weird things happen to me while in the woods, and I think they are similar to some of the other people's experiences you have shared. A little about myself. I'm in my 40s mid 40s and I live in the Shenandoah Valley of Virginia between the Blue Ridge Mountains. I've hunted and fished since an early age and still try to get outside as much as I can. I had four separate experiences about 20 to 25 years ago on the same property which was roughly 200 acres in size which may be Sasquatch related. The first experience happened near dark in the early fall while I was bow hunting for deer. I was sitting in my tree stand looking up the mountain when I saw something large and dark in color moving down a very steep part of the mountain at a high rate of speed. It was roughly 2.5 times the size of most deer I saw in the area. I've never seen anything move so fast in the woods like that thing did. It moved in a direction I had it moved in the direction I had to go to get to my vehicle. I didn't have a flashlight, and I only had my bow for protection. At the time I thought that had to be a bear, right? I know how you felt when you described your first experience and your long walk back to your truck. I inched along, scared to death, listening for anything approaching. I finally made it back to my vehicle, and I've never hunted with a bow since that day. Well, that sucks. That sucks to hear that. I also gave up black powder rifle because I want more than one shot. It didn't keep me out of the woods. I merely changed my choice of weapon and only carry a gun capable of holding more than one cartridge. My second experience happened about 200 yards away from the first while deer hunting again. I had a rifle this time, and I hiked most of the way up the mountain. I stopped at a spot and sat on the ground where I had great visibility looking down below me, and I sat and watched for maybe 45 minutes. As I stood to continue my hike up the mountain, I heard a loud noise 30 feet behind me. 
It was the sound of something large running up the mountain behind me. As I tried to make sense of what was happening, I felt confused, like my mind was missing something. Almost like your punch drunk. I continued to hear something running up the mountain, through the mountain laurel, but I couldn't see anything. Whatever was making that much noise should have been visible to me. I kept waiting to hear a deer blow, but I never heard another sound. I went and looked behind me where the noise originated, and I could clearly see where something had flattened the leaves where it sat watching me. It gave me the creeps to know something large was watching me from behind and never made a sound until I got up to move. My third experience happened in the spring around spring gobbler season. I was driving up the tree-cut road to the spot where I would shoot my rifles. I go shooting up here weekly, and I had my L Labrador Retriever with me. She always enjoyed the trips up to the mountain, and she would be so excited that she could barely stay in the truck. I would leave the window down, and she would have her head out the window, anxious to get out. Most of the time, she would jump over me to get out of the truck, because she loved it so much. The day was di This day was different. As we approached the area where I would set up my portable shooting bench, I heard a loud noise up the mountain. I had the radio on, so I couldn't quite make out the sound. I turned the radio down and stopped the truck, and this time, I heard a roar, unlike anything I've ever heard. No human being could make a sound that loud. The roar was about 150 yards up the mountain in the next hollow, pronounced holler for the non-southerners and sounded like he was angled away from me and slightly uphill. I remember thinking, what the F was that? I sat and listened for 30 seconds to a minute and then opened the door of my truck to get out. I looked over at my dog and she was shaking uncontrollably and did not move from the truck seat. I called to her and she didn't pay attention to me. I grabbed her, tried to pull her out of the truck. She fought me with all she had to stay in the truck. I finally wrestled her out, and when she was on the ground, she kept shaking and stumbling, like a drunk would do. My mind was still trying to process what the hell was going on, and I started to walk up the road in the direction of the sound. And all of a sudden, this feeling of fear and dread came over me, it made me sick to my stomach. I remember thinking, I'm not afraid. Why do I feel afraid? I looked back at my dog and thought, am I scared because she's scared? The only other thing which scared her were thunderstorms, and I thought to myself, I don't get scared when she gets scared during a storm. I had a moment of clarity, and I looked up the road, and I said in my mind, whatever the F is over there, you stay on your side, and I'll stay on mine. I have a truck full of loaded guns, and I'm going to shoot them. In a few seconds, the feeling of dread left me, and I noticed my dog snapped out of it too. We spent a couple of hours shooting but I never went over to where I heard the sound where, to, to where I heard the sound originate. My fourth experience happened in the early fall before deer season. My wife and I and the lab I mentioned in the previous experience were up the mountain next to the hunting cabin and a quarter acre pond. The area around the pond and cabin started to get overgrown with white pines and started to make visibility around it difficult. Plus, there was an old logging road across the dam, and the pines on it would not allow me to drive my truck across it anymore. So I was cutting some of them down to open it up. As we finished, we became aware of something making a growling sound and pacing back and forth just out of eyesight in the pines. It was probably 40 yards away. This time, the dog was growling, teeth showing, hair standing on end. I also got the feeling of all the hair on my body standing up. My wife was afraid too. The strange part for me was the heavy footsteps and the breaking of large branches. It kept pacing back and forth like I would expect a human being to do protecting some imaginary line. It was so odd. What does that? My wife and I decided, to ne decided we needed to leave now. So we grabbed everything and got in the truck and left. We talked about it later and she thought it was weird. But we were not sure what to make of it. I continued to hunt the property, but never had anything like those experiences happen again. I had one other weird thing, which may be Sasquatch-related, happen on a different property. I don't want to take any more of your time. God bless you, Steve. 
Hey, Mr. Macaroni, rest in peace. Your friend, Brian Armel. Brian, you should have added in, my man. We want to hear all of it. You're not taking up too much of my time. When you're sharing knowledge and experience, you're not taking up my time, too much time. That's time I want to spend here doing this. Does that make sense, that sentence? <laughs> anyway, you know, here's the thought. You know, before I said, uh, if anybody's got the set of balls on them, when, you, when you're being intimidated like that, if you just went like this, up your ass. Ram it up your ass. I'm going up that trail and I give a shit what you got to say about it. What would happen? Now, follow me. So when you're just sharing this one with me and a pile of other people, you know, when you watch, you, you can watch a lot of uh, videos on YouTube. Let's say some of these guys in Africa um, culling problem elephants, hunting elephants, whatever, whatever they're doing. Usually it's conservation orientated. Whether you like to, whether you agree or not, that's what they're doing. But anyway, when sometimes they're approaching that herd, the great big bull will put their, African bulls will put their elephants, put their ears straight out and they're fucking whip their, their uh, trunks in the air. And they'll come and they'll charge a human being standing there. And intimidate, obviously, the living shit out of your average human. Lots of people run. I know a couple of camera guys that have been involved in that and, and, uh, caught it on video and it was really intimidating to hear the stories how intimidating intimidated they were when they relayed the stories to me about what really went down anyway but there's something you can do as a human being to stand there and stand your ground and then turn that elephant around and make it run away from you it's pretty bizarre to watch a lot of these experienced phs in africa professional hunters they know how to do it now how many bullies too? I've come across bullies all my life, unfortunately. I've had I've had some pretty big bully. I remember classic reaction where this one time this big ugly ass bully. Um always slinging his dick, trying to intimidate everybody. And and finally he uh, came out of me one time and I'm like, let's get it on, man. <laughs> I just looked at him and stared him down the end. I'm like, let's go. Let's go. Let's do this. And I added in some more some more colorful, color colorful words, and you can see the his, the look in his face changed like, uh-oh, this isn't going to be good. And he talked to his tail and ran. So what I'm saying is, I wonder, I mean, this seems to be a common pattern with these beings. They do whatever they can to intimidate the living shit out of us when people speak out to them. Like this person just did the email. Well, all of a sudden everything goes away. <laughs> right? It's almost like your classic bullying, classic bully reaction. Coward. It seems to be almost all the time, almost every one of these emails, right? Nobody's ever had, had one of these people growl at them, smash branches, stomp in the ground, pace back and forth, and then uh, commit to coming and grabbing a pop in your head off or your partner beside you or picking up your dog in front of you and ripping it in half and throwing it on the ground and standing there staring at you. None of that shit goes down, right? Correct me if I'm wrong. Maybe I'm not remembering some previous emails, but it seems to be the, a pretty freaking strong pattern. I'd say we're almost batting at 100% when it comes to that. Growled at. The, the uh, overwhelming feeling of absolute terror. If you come forward anywhere close, you're going to die. Thoughts in your head. But everybody, obviously, comes out of it okay because they're emailing in. Right? Isn't that weird? I find it really weird. That's either uh, so far from my experience, direct experience with a lifetime of bullies and bullies in my home and as a kid. It just seems to be your classic, classic actions of a true coward. <laughs> it does, right? No matter you, I don't give a shit if you're nine or 14 feet tall or two feet tall. It's still the actions of a classic coward when it comes to human being, human characteristics, right? Do whatever you can and try to look menacing until one of these, until somebody finally turns around and says, okay, let's go. You know, it's funny. I'm going to tell you guys a funny story. Remind, that reminded me of a funny story i got to share. A little off topic, but sort of not. Here's this dork who grew up with, not grew up with, hung out, associated by friends. You know, you always got friends who have friends, blah, blah, blah. We're at this big dance, drunk up, where were we, Parksville. And, uh. There's a big skafuffle gonna go down right, and there's a bunch of guys from Up Island squaring off with all these other guys from South Island. 
and um, and this idiot. I know who he is. Not a friend. Wasn't a friend, but I know who he is. He's like fair sized guy, you know, six foot two, something like that. And he comes up and he looks at the smaller guy. He looks at the smaller guy on their side of the line. He goes, "I want to fight you." Right? And he says it from behind somebody. Anyways, the smaller guy goes like this. All right. <clears throat> Spits his front teeth out, puts them in his pocket, and goes, let's go. <laughs> <laughs> and the look on this guy's face as he melted right there. It was so freaking classic comical, right? The smaller guy's standing there not saying nothing, minding his own business, but kind of feeling it out. And then the... The, the so-called bigger tough guy says, I want to fight you. Okay. <laughs> Spits his teeth out, puts them in his pocket. Awesome. Okay, sorry. Now, moving along. <laughs> I don't know. It just seems like uh, these beings, they listen. When a human being gets angry and, and throws down the verbal law within your mouth and your mind, they, see, they seem to listen, right? Like, oh, oh, I pissed off the human. This isn't good. I got to get out of here. Maybe, right? All right, here we go. Here's a new one. Another one. Holy, whoa. This is a good one. Here we go. No paragraphs, as usual. Hey, Steve, I'd like to share my encounter with you and get your opinion. My encounter happened the, the first day of bow season, 2019. Let me start by telling you that my father passed away in the week of opening day in 2014. That is the only deer season in my 41 years that I've missed since I was big enough to draw a bow. Up until his passing, my father had written permission to hunt a 1,200-acre plot of forest in the far northern part of Ohio, and this is where we would spend every opening day for the biggest part of my hunting career. Upon his passing, I started hunting with my brother-in-law on his property just a few miles up the road from the house I had rented for the last 10 years. Last year was different. I had, a minor, I, had a, I had a minor medical scare and thought for a few days my life was going to be cut short. I pulled through, but it left me with a feeling of emptiness. A feeling that everything I wanted to accomplish in my lifetime and had been working toward was a waste of time. <clears throat> Excuse me. Knowing now that death was inevitable and there's nothing I could do to prevent it terrified me. Any time in life I hit... Any time in life I hit hard times or was struggling, I'd always turn to my dad. He always knew what to say or exactly how hard I needed to be kicked in the ass to come out of whatever was troubling me at the time. So my reason for telling you all this is maybe, is so maybe, you understand why last year I felt I wanted to be close to my dad, which is why I made the decision to make the 45 minute drive as I left my house opening day and completely blew my brother off so I could hunt the property my dad and I had so many life-changing memories at. And even though I no longer had permission to be there, the landowner lived in Florida. And all the years we ever hunted it, we never saw a single other person. So I was confident that it would, I would be fine. As I, as I ran through our normal routine of stopping at McDonald's, grabbing a quick cup of coffee, then stopping under the overpass light when we exited the highway to to put three arrows each into the foam target we always brought, just to be sure our bows didn't get knocked around from the year before. Then the 45 minute drive into nothing but timber till we reached the property that I considered considered my idea of paradise. Once we arrived, we'd put on our gear and hike single file the mile and a half until we came to the fork, at which point we would grunt toward one another and split up knowing we would both be back at the truck to grab our quads by lunch, having already filled our tags. The only time, <clears throat> excuse me, the only time that wasn't the case was in 2013, when my dad decided he felt like he should ride his quad to his stand due to his declining health, to which I suggested I would just take mine and drop him at his stand and then move on to mine, which resulted in my not even seeing a single deer that day by pushing a huge 12 point right to him when I left to go to my stand. And I believe somehow he made a kill shot on it before it was even light enough for me to see. So back to the fact, 4.45 AM, I locked my truck, headed into this property. At 5.15, I was at the fork at which time 
for some reason, I found myself walking to his old stand instead of mine. This is the first time I had a gut feeling. Maybe I was making a mistake being here. Once I reached his old stand at 535, I started climbing into the tree. At, at which point, one of the fold-out pegs I had installed several years before busted, resulting in my falling and splitting my shin wide open. As I sat there bleeding pretty severely into my sock and boot, I thought maybe I should just go. But the image of a buck we had seen off and on through the years and the thought he was up there laughing at me changed my mind and I started my ascent again. I got to the stand, which in my opinion was too close to the ground. And now that I was seeing it up close for the first time in years, I realized that seeing as how bad the wood was rotten on it, maybe it wasn't safe to hunt out of. But again, I ignored my gut and climbed into it and started pulling my gear. Then the rope broke. <laughs> the old gut, right? You go against your gut, you'll lose every single time, no matter what the topic. Can this morning get any effing worse, I thought, as I got down and realized I had snapped the sight off of my bow and made the biggest mistake of my life and returned to the stand, being invested in the hunt too much to give up now. Once I sat down, I listened for a second. Really good. It took notice of how quiet it was. Brushing it off to the fact I just had performed a circus act that even I would have paid to see while getting in the tree. I sat back, settled in to watch the sun rise. 5.50 a.m. I heard a stick break. And then a roar. That still now, as I am writing about it, sends chills to my bones. And made hair I didn't even know stand up. I felt this sound in my very soul and still wake up once, still wake up once a week trembling from the dream I keep having of these events. Directly after this noise came crashing, directly after this noise came crashing that sounded like a Mack truck coming through the woods directly behind my stand and then the silence. Several minutes passed and then came a couple of hoots and grunts like I've never heard before in all my years in the woods. In these woods. I was struggling to lean around the tree and squinting into the still darkness, trying to see where all this is coming from. And then from the corner of my eye, I saw it. At least what I thought for that moment was it. It was the very buck that we had chased for years. Never having seen it within range, I emotionally sat motionlessly sat and was paralyzed by the size of this deer. We have some of the biggest bucks in the world in Ohio. And right that second, I knew I was looking at a once in a lifetime deer, but something wasn't right. It kept getting closer and lighter. And then I saw it. This deer had a tree limb about four inches around and three feet long hanging out of its lower middle. I took notice of the limb as it now had turned and was walking out into the field in front of me and saw that all the limbs were broken off of this small tree hanging from the deer's guts. Had it tried to jump behind me and come down in such a way that it gutted itself on a tree? It made no sense. But as it started to turn broadside, not 10 yards out, I went to stand up and my left foot crashed through the rotten board on the stand, and I froze. But the strangest thing happened that even today I'm afraid to recall in order to get your opinion on this matter. The deer now, staring directly at me, had a look in its eyes that almost made me feel like it wanted me to kill it. And as I watched my arrow disappear through its chest, I walked a few more yards and just and just lay over, sorry, one more time. And as I watched my arrow disappear through its chest, it walked a few more yards and then just lay over on its side. Then came more crashing behind me. And I just knew at any moment more deer were gonna come around the base of my tree. And then I felt the tree shake ever so slightly. 
when I looked down to my right, my life changed forever. I was staring straight into the face of a beast, and it roared again, and I felt the pressure of its grip. What? I felt the pressure of its grip tightening on my boot. I yanked my foot away and fell back into the seat of the stand, just as the buck started kicking its legs like it was running away, laying there. This got the thing's attention, and in what seemed like a single leap and motion, I watched as this thing stood erect in front of me and tore that deer literally in half. As it slung the antlered half of the deer on its shoulder and leapt into the ravine, it came out of another... Sorry. As it slung the antlered half of the deer on its shoulder and leapt into the ravine, it came out of another smaller one emerged in front of me and picked up the back half of the deer and followed suit. So I think he meant another one came out and grabbed the other half of the deer and followed suit. I heard them in the bottom of the ravine ravishing their take and I leapt from the stand and rolled once, hit my feet and ran till I felt like my heart was going to explode. And as I reached my truck already having my keys in my hand, I fumbled with the door for what seemed like eternity then sped off and drove 100 miles an hour home. I walked into the front door at right before 7.30 a.m. Sometime during my ride home, I realized I had soiled my pants. And when I walked through the door, my wife met me and just I just hugged her sobbing and soiled. I called down, I calmed down enough to push past her and made my way to the shower to clean up. She asked where this deer was why I was covered in blood, but I couldn't say anything. In fact, until a few days ago, I hadn't spoken of this, and she respected me enough to not ask. I sent my encounter into blank blank, and he told it online. He changed it up to the point I felt it wasn't my story at all. So I did a little more research and had several comments to the story he told that said I should send it to you. and Maybe you could shine some light on all this. Hunting was my life. I'm terrified to check my mailbox because of the bush in my front yard, and it will be a cold day in hell before I ever think about going into the woods again. I realized a few things I spent the better part of this year trying to make sense of what happened, and this is what I know. These things are real. They had speared that deer, and had that deer not started kicking, and I shot my pants, it was going to drag me from my stand. For what? I'll never know. All right, so just so, you know, I don't promote channels. When people try to promote a channel, I don't promote. But I think out of respect for this man, I'll read the sentence one more time. I sent my encounter into Dixie Cryptic, Cryptic, and he told it online, and he changed it up to the point I felt it wasn't my story. That's pretty weak. There you go. That's one hell of a what the F frickin' story, experience, that's terrifying, that's every human being's worst, worst nightmare if you're a hunter, he had his hand on your boot, whoa, in a tree stand, I sat in tree stands, I don't, I don't hunt in stands, but I had no choice, you know, I've hunted in Alabama, and my friends left me to stand up there in those deep dark woods and that, those oak leaves, and I was up a big oak tree, and, uh, and you can hear, you know, armadillos sound like a small truck going through the woods at times. The noises that come out of those those uh, deep leaves in the forest floor. And then you imagine my imagination obviously can go, well, I'm sitting in those stands down south when I know what's running around. And then, of course, you start picturing it, right? I feel, I feel um, vulnerable in a tree stand myself. I just do. And also, but as far as hunting goes, I don't like to be able to, to be, I don't like the feeling of being stuck in a tree stand watching a huge buck cruise by and not being able to do anything about it. I like going after him. But anyway, aside from that, I'm just saying I've been in a tree stand and I could not imagine going through what you went through. That is freaking horrible. Now, the odd, one of the odd points of that one are, uh, it's amazing that something, something so big and powerful 
would actually expend the energy to rip the deer in half and take half away and then have another one come out and grab the other half like like it needed help like it needed the help did it tear that thing in half as a example you know what i mean making a statement <laughs> that's a shitty experience that would that would absolutely ruin anybody's life seeing something like that picture it that's like a horror movie sure maybe you know i'm saying oh i don't believe it i don't give a shit who i i, I don't give a flying shit who does or doesn't believe anything i don't care we're getting everybody's voices heard the fact of the matter is the majority of shit going on in our real world is unbelievable and kept from us that is a fact i hope that by now the majority of the people that come here accept the fact that we are being lied to from day one right and the truth is too much for your average human brain to accept who wakes up in the morning and thinks up all those details right who does that one you know we had another one recently where the first time i offered up my opinion on whether i thought it was real or not but i mean come on that was my gut was screaming this is just a movie script it's just you can tell you know your gut knows you I, I do believe that we know the answers to so much we just do but we're not connected inside right we have been raised and educated educated taught to have to listen to an external source for truth instead of being taught to connect with our internal and go with it because we already know we have more skills that we are not being taught to enhance cultivate mature i know i've already said it i'm not the best word slinger on the planet but i think you're picking up what i'm putting down we have been conditioned to look for the answers from a different source meaning another human being a stranger not even anybody we grew up with stuffed in a room and then there's a head at the room we've been conditioned to listen to that person if we don't we're in trouble if we don't repeat what they say accurately you're going to be a failure right you can't get much more shitty conditioning than that that's like that is such a violation anyway that's another rabbit not a rabbit hole that's, that's just another whole topic that i could go down i probably don't make sense babbling about it right now but from what i know from what i know firsthand it's almost like we are dropped into a slave ring right it's like being born in a cage you don't know any different and then all of a sudden one of those little animals us escapes the cage and looks at everything from outside the cage and goes uh oh holy shit is this wrong well, that's me babbling that's one hell of a story man i appreciate you sending that in and uh if you're still here following the channel you may please or i encourage you to hit up the comment section below this video and assure everyone that your your email was read word for word all right if we can get anything out of i can get anything out of that because uh just to hear that somebody else is changing up people's experiences and then sharing them publicly that is such a violation i don't give a shit who you are that is such a effing violation you know the the courage it takes for someone to even acknowledge with themselves that the shit really went down most people can't, don't even have the guts to share it with their freaking spouse they'll come forward to stranger here in public worldville thinking it's a safe place they've chosen to share their experience with which they can't wrap their noodle around which has affected their life ultimately changed their course of life and usually not for a good in a good direction and then to have that place they thought was a safe place fuck them in the ass and change the story piece of shit anybody who does that to a human being today is a piece of shit if you see it publicly i'm going to call you on it get in your face and call you a piece of shit all right sorry sorry not sorry yeah i can get a little fired up that's why i'm here because i'm sick of the pieces of shit taking advantage of and screwing over the people especially these people especially you people where it takes so much guts 
to come forward with your experience and then you get screwed in the end from somebody who yeah piece of shit there you go <laughs> all right <clears throat> moving along make sure if you are still here make sure you try comment this in the comment section below to make sure uh the people know that you know that your experience was shared word for word coming out of your mouth all right All right, got a little fired up there. Barbara Minneapolis is the title of this next email, which will be wor read word for word. And do we know what we're about to read? Nope. Hey, Steve, not sure if you remember me. I was the barber at the Great Clips in the Skyway by the Starbucks in the Target in Minneapolis. I think I told my story of seeing a floating orb and being scared out of my campsite. If not, I'll be brief. I went hiking with 14 people. Seven of us spent the night. I was ultralight backpacking, so I slept next to the fire, keeping it going throughout the night. I went to go to the bathroom around 1 a.m., making my way to a tree. I froze in my tracks as I watched an orb the size of a volleyball float on the other side of this tree. When I snapped out of it, I went to step around the tree. It was gone. The next morning, I told the others. No one seemed to notice anything. A few years later, I went to the same spot. And this time, I was by myself. No one has been there, has been in there in a while. So I took a shovel out of the old cabin to dig out the fire pit. Making my way back, something flew by my head. I heard that doesn't belong to you or that's not yours. Okay, there's no quotation, so I'm guessing this is... Let me read it again. I heard. I'm guessing, quote, that doesn't belong to you or that's not yours, end quote. I froze and looked around. Not noticing anything, it must have been a fly, but and my mind was playing tricks on me. Later that night, maybe 11 p.m., I heard a growl outside my tent. I made noise and grabbed my gun to scare whatever it was. No tracks, no sign. Just a really bright white moon. Later on 1 a.m., something hit the side wall of my tent where I was sleeping. I jumped out of my tent and got the fire going. I sat next to the fire trying to focus. Do I leave or stay? I was in total flight or fight mode. I grabbed my gear and left. It took me five hours to get back to my car. I kept looking back to see if anything was following me. I was so exhausted. That when my mother saw me, she panicked and told me if I don't call her at noon and told me if I don't call her at noon or she was going to call 911. On the drive out of the canyon, I puked. It looked like water and maybe a piece of dried pineapple or a bean. Huh? You described your puke there? It lost me there. Later that month, I would get the same feeling at night, seeing a tall shadowy figure in my doorway and a small white slash humanoid arm. This happened in my room, sharing an apartment with my mother. This happened at Haunted Canyon, Arizona. Tony Cabin, Tony Ranch Spring, sleeping in, out in the back country. Will never be the same. Okay, you bit of punctuation. So you meant sleeping in or out in the back country will never be the same. Being out in the back country will never be the same. You are right. I think I even looked at and said, you've seen things are being out there. Back in Arizona, due to the chaos that happened in Minneapolis, I've been out hunting and scouting, etc. Might start making YouTube videos again. All right. Okay, I got you, man. There you go. A little awkward, but we got to share it. Yes, it does change your life. It changes your life. There's no way out of that one. Uh, burr, 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 burr. Hold on a second now. Let me get back to... i got to make a note here. i got to make sure I can share this name because I don't think I shared it.
Okay, so the previous email, the man whose cha story was changed, his name is Dennis Bishop. All right, you guys? So if you do a little sleuthing or you want to do a little commenting somewhere else, the man's name whose, cha whose story was changed, his name was Dennis Bishop. Okay. Move it along. <clears throat> Excuse me. Now, what's this one? This is a short one with no title. No, no title on the email. And no, I don't need email titles, just so you guys know. I'm not saying put a title on your email, okay? I'm just saying there's no title. Hey, Steve, I hope you're doing well. My name is Logan. I'm from a small town of Massey, Ontario. I live outside of the town, and my neighbors are roughly one kilometers apart to give you an idea of the rural area I live in. It's mainly fields and bush all around. On Saturday, December 5th, 2020, I had an encounter with one of these beings. Me and my dad were going out to our camp to check the minnow trap we have in a creek beside our camp as we enjoy ice fishing and minnows make great bait. Anyway, we left our house and drove by our neighbor's house and they weren't home as there were no cars or anything in their driveway. And as I looked out the window, I seen what I thought was a person probably 350 yards away walking near the edge of the field. I realized there were, what? A person. I realized they were wearing completely black and were huge to put in perspective. I'm 6'5", 250 pounds and in no way a small guy. My dad is 5'10", 190 pounds. Not a small guy either. When we deer hunt together, he walks out to his and I walk through the bush to my stand. As I walk, I can see him. And from 350 yards, he looks absolutely tiny compared to how big this thing was from that distance. I estimated at least 10 feet tall and at least three and a half feet shoulder to shoulder. I watched your channel for two plus years. I've always been interested in the topic and never thought I would see one of these beings. Anyways, I'll update you if I have any further encounters with one of these beings. And P.S. Keep up what you're doing, Steve. Don't let anyone tell you otherwise. You're a good, hard-working, hard -working, honest guy. Appreciate the kind words. There you go. I think you just had a little bit of a typo in there when it sounded like you were seeing plural. But you only saw one, right? Only. I shouldn't say only. You saw one. There you go. Another welcome to the club and no return. Another one. Another member. Now it's funny how I get, I'll admit it, I get fired up sometimes and it takes me a while to come down. But I can go into fight mode. And once I get there, I stay there for a little bit and I growl and grind my teeth. And I want to grab somebody. <laughs> I want to grab the perpetrator. Can't help it. I can't help it. I'm not ashamed of it either, actually. Now, this is titled, Have Mike Ray Contact Us from Southwest Washington. Hello, Steve. We were watching your program, and there was a story from a man named Mike Ray. His email was about he and his dad that set four cameras around a swamp with a creek that runs into the Chehalis River in southwestern Washington. One of the trees that camera was on was broken off above the camera, and it was taken off and never found the camera. He spoke of a herd of elk that ran Winlock, Vader, Pael, and Adna. He mentioned that he would like to learn more and would like for someone to go out with him. Is there a way to get in contact with him? You can share my email with him. I'll also add Victor's phone number. We are hunters, fishermen, and know the area he is speaking of. Thanks, Steve. We all got to stick together. We appreciate all that you stand for. May, Neil, and Victor. All right, there you go. Shared. So if the man wants to email and contact with you guys, I'm sure he's just email me again. All right, to the man that's trying to get a hold of, just email me again and I'll forward off and hook you up. And I try not to make, don't make a habit of that, you guys. All right, my time is so slim normally. I will do it this one time. I think I've done it before, actually, with other with some groups. Ooh, this one's a fair size. This will probably be the last one for today. It's titled One Typo and One More Experience. Hello, Steve, and yes, you can use my name again. All right, what's your name? Barbara B. I previously sent you an email. Again, 
this May 2023. It was a bit lengthy about my hunting adventure and losing a deer that I was tracking. I spoke also about being at my brother's residence letting his dog out when that incredible, alarmingly loud vocalization came from the woods scaring us. The date that I was there and next door to my mother's residence was 2006, not 1908. <laughs> so sorry for that typo. In that email, I forgot to include the story about the trip my mother, oldest sister, younger brother, and myself went on in Vandalia, New York. Vandalia. Vandalia or Vandalia, New York. Swamp to pick blueberries, about 1975. Vandalia is a small community outside of Allegheny, North New York, both about 12 minutes northwest of the Pennsylvania border. Limestone, New York. Bradford, PA and Allegheny National Forest. I've lived in this area most of my life. Dad grew up in this area and spent his free time in the woods hunting, trapping, and fishing. And he taught all of us children these skills as we grew up. Mom even used to traipse along with him hunting in the early years married before us children were born. She never liked the swamps and bogs of Vandalia. It was also referred to as Chipmunk, New York. The woods were mostly hardwoods and pines, and big game was plentiful. It also bordered the Seneca Indian Reservation, going westerly towards Salamanca, Salamanca, New York. Let me take you and the readers of the club on this adventure. We parked along the road and entered the woods on foot. We carried our buckets and our bug spray as mosquitoes and deer flies were quite, were quite plentiful and pesky back in the big woods. Wild blueberries and blackberries grew plentiful, and black bear frequented the area, this area daily. As we crossed many fallen younger trees that crisscrossed our path to the berries, the, go the going was slow for our mother. She had been in a bad car accident and had been hit by a drunk driver in the early morning hours some years before as she was delivering newspapers on a daily rural route to help support our household too. Dad was a union carpenter and millwright in the spring and fall season, and there were five of us children, and Dad had plenty of jobs to keep us busy. Dad thought this would be a great adventure for us to go on, but he wasn't interested in accompanying us. After we crossed the grid of fallen trees, we were seeing a large group of people exiting the same woods. They were very quiet, not speaking or even greeting us as they hastily walked out of the woods, and the berry patch, laden with buckets, and roasters filled with wild blueberries. Wow. Even when we spoke to them and tried to make small talk, none of them responded to us and walked past. Odd. Further into the woods we went, determined now to see how many berries may be left there to harvest. We passed a large conifer tree and that was shredded into its bark by large, by large claw marks, and its sticky sap dripped forth catching bugs in it. This is alarming to view. But we pressed further down the path that these same people passed us on. We stalked about 200 yards in, decided to spray ourselves generously with bug repellent. We then began picking. There were plenty more blueberries to be harvested. Many of the berries were high up, as the last group picked everything at waist level. At one point, my brother saw something big and dark cross the path behind us where we had walked in. That uh, background sound, for anybody curious, is a drain pipe right on the outside of the corner of the room and sheet metal. So it's, it's, uh, it's just water, all right? Draining loudly. He wasn't sure if it was a bear or not because it was fast. It was big and it was dark in color. We thought perhaps maybe a bear had chased those folks out, but we continued to pick and stayed vigilant now. We're only armed with buckets and bug spray. Whose idea was this anyway? We picked for about 20 minutes when we began to hear rustling over and through the berry bushes. The actual bushes were about 15 feet tall and dense. We didn't hear any other noise like gro growling or grunting. It seemed as we walked, it kept up with us. When we stopped, then it would stop walking and stop rustling the other side of the brush. It was a hot summer day and there was not a breath of a breeze that far into the swamp. Just bugs circling and buzzing about our heads and arms. The noise of the bushes rustling started to alarm us. We couldn't figure what it could be. 
would have, we would have heard a, bo a bear, sorry, we would have heard a bear. Was it a deer? Could it be a local native resident fearful that we were too close to his favorite berry patch and the reservation borderland? Excuse me, was someone trying to scare us out of there? Though plentiful, we weren't getting the berry bounty as quickly as we should have had we gotten there earlier. We pushed further down the path. It kept up with us. We knew Dad would bitch if we didn't come home with buckets full, but at one point, my mom made the decision that we should leave. Leave now. The hell with the attitude we would get from Dad when we got home only one-third full. Brother and I were eating berries as fast as we were also putting them in the bucket. So we reluctantly turned around and headed back out of the berry swamp to our car parked out on the road. Mom by then had had enough, and honestly, I think she was becoming quite fearful of what was just on the other side of the bushes. As we got back into the downed tree grid area, Mom lost her balance and fell down. We tried to get her to her feet, but she fell again, with her feet tangled in the downed trees. I'll never forget her saying, Run to the car, save yourselves, leave me here, I can't get up. I'll get out here somehow. Just all you kids, run. Holy shit, run? Save ourselves from what? Will gave it her best and together yanked her out of those crisscross fallen trees like she was a rag doll. They seem like crappy, poplar variety of tree. They just lay everywhere, strewn about the ground. We weren't leaving. Mom laying there helpless and tangled on the forest floor. Whatever was following us, we didn't dare look back to see. We didn't want to see it. Was it a black bear? A wendigo? A scary old man dressed in rags and feathers sporting a bear hide rug over his shoulders? Nearing the roadway, we encountered the husband and the grown son of my father's cousin. They too were going in to pick some berries. This must be quite a popular place. <clears throat> Excuse me, we told them of the thing that was pacing us back there in the bush and we weren't staying. They said they'd call us later if they saw anything suspicious. They said all they could smell was our bug spray and possibly whatever it was couldn't figure out what we were and that's why it stayed near to us. Say what? Yes, they called us later that evening to say they did not see a bear but could smell something rank there once we left with our bug spray aroma and that could very well have been a bear. All the stories that I've heard from the other club members here, I know what it was now. It was no bear. It walked like a man just beyond us there in the dense brush. I do think it saw what we were, but the smell of the spray had it confused. Yes, Dad bitched about us not bringing home enough berries because he wanted Mom to make a pie. It didn't happen. Mom told him straight up if he wanted a pie, go back to pick his own berries. She and her children would never go back in that swamp again. Thanks for allowing me to share. I have repressed this memory until recently. We were pretty spooked by everything that happened that day in that short amount of time, but no way were we leaving Mom there. Best regards, Barbara Ann Boser in Allegheny, New York. All right, there you go. Appreciate that share, and I have a funny feeling your mom obviously seen it, right? <laughs> obviously. Obviously saw it, didn't want to see it, didn't want to tell the kids what you saw, you probably didn't want to tell anybody what you saw once you got home, right? Which is common. Now, moving along, getting going here. I think I only got one more a day of hardcore editing, so. So there you go, there's a bunch more, and there's a whole pile more ready to be uh, shared yet. So, if you've got something that's gonna help the people or help you or help me, make sure you get it shared. Word, you'll get it shared word, word for word here, no matter what. Share my story at howtohunt.com or Tell my story at howtohunt.com, all right? Just get it out, get it shared, and um, get it all in one, all in one. Don't don't leave any out. You got another, if you have another one for another time, this is the time, put it in the same email, all right? I'll be back again.